Hey everybody, it's Dr. Osher here with a lecture on financial, ethical, legal, and social issues related to genetics. So lots of genetic disorders and treatments for genetic disorders have a lot of considerations regarding who pays for them, is it ethical, is it legal, what are the social implications of this for families, for society as a whole, and this lecture is really meant to just barely scratch the surface of that and get your wheels turning about how ethics and the law and finance and social issues are related to genetics in all other areas as well. So there are some roles for nurses that are specific to the financial, ethical, legal, and social issues, um, and they are outlined in the Essentials of Genetic and Genomic Nursing, Competencies, Curricular Guidelines, and Outcome Indicators. From a financial standpoint, it's our responsibility to advocate for access to genetic resources for patients, um, you know, making inquiries with insurance, finding um, community groups and other sources of funding when relevant, if that's something that we are able to do. From an ethical perspective, we need to advocate for our clients' rights and also for their autonomy in their decision-making um, for what is best for them and their families. From a legal standpoint, we need to maintain patient privacy and confidentiality, especially surrounding genetic information, which is unique and identifiable to you. And then from a social perspective, we need to recognize our own biases and preferences and values as they impact our thoughts and the, um, you know, have the potential to impact the care that we give. And we need to give our patients non-directive counseling to enable them to make their own autonomous and informed decision um, you know, that works for them and isn't just based off of what we think is best for us. So you can read this um, competencies here at the link. Some financial issues. There was the Association for Molecular Pathology versus Myriad Genetics Incorporated, um, and this is related to the BRCA1 gene mutation testing. So they were the first company who had um, figured out how to sequence and determine your genotype for the BRCA1 mutation. Um, but before that, there were a lot of other genes that had been patented and, you know, used for testing purposes. Naturally, scientists, you know, we like money. We want to protect our intellectual property. Um, but with this particular test, there was a lot of outrage because the, the you know, public was sort of gaining interest in this particular thing because breast cancer is so common and there are some actionable things that can be done, such as a prophylactic mastectomy. Um, and so eventually this ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, some Eventually the Supreme Court ruled that genes are a product of nature and cannot be patented. Um, so we no longer have patents on genes. But some questions that remain are, you know, who pays for people who have genetic disorders and the treatment that they need, whether it be breast cancer or otherwise? Um, should there be a limit on how much care costs or how much insurers or the public or, you know, the government is willing to pay? Um, you know, who should pay for these tests? Is there any obligation of companies to offer these tests for free? Um, and also what can be done broadly to address genetic disparities across the board and across the globe? some key terms from the NIH glossary, and I will just put a plug in. There are a number of other good ethical glossaries. The University of Texas at Austin also has a really good video glossary with a lot of good terms for you to check out if you are searching for something or want to see some good animated examples. Um, so we'll just briefly go through these. I know y'all can read. <clears throat> Accountability is taking responsibility for your own conduct. You know, we, we as nurses have a professional code of ethics that we have to follow, and we are accountable to that. Autonomy refers to making reasonable decisions, you know, in a non-coerced way based off of the best available information for decision making. Paternalism is something um, that we see especially in kids, but also in people with diminished capacity as well as just other people in vulnerable populations, um, which is Restricting somebody's decision-making when you think it's for their own good, you sort of feel like a father figure and you know what's best for them. And, you know, I saw an example of this once when um, 
a physician was encouraging um, people with family members with Huntington's disease that he said, so this is why you should all get tested so that you are, you know, and you're empowered. And getting tested for Huntington's disease and finding out that you have the gene mutation associated with it is basically finding out that you're a ticking time bomb for this devastating condition unless, you know, you die of something else sooner. Um, and so in his mind, he thought that he was, you know, doing good by telling them what to do, but some people maybe don't want to have that information. Two related terms are beneficence, which is the obligation to do good, and non-malfeasance, the duty to avoid causing harm. Um, we also have confidentiality, of course. Oops, typo on this slide. It should be HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, the obligation to keep information confidential and secret. Um, HIPAA is not enough, and we'll talk about additional protections that have been added on top of HIPAA. Justice is treating people fairly, and there's different types of justice that you can look up on your own if you're curious. Distributive justice is um, here, and procedural justice will go a little bit into those, but there's also some other things you can see online. So distributive justice refers to the allocation of benefits and harms fairly. This could be in terms of you know, who's in drug trials and who benefits from those drugs um, and therapies that result. And then procedural justice is more about using fair processes to make decisions that are going to affect people. And you'll find that for any ethical scenario, different people with different viewpoints might be applying the same terms differently. So, you know, in the case of a pregnant woman who um, is low income and doesn't feel like she has the capacity to care for a kid, she might argue that beneficence, the doing the right thing, means not bringing a child into this world that she can't support, whereas, you know, her mother or partner might say that uh, beneficence, doing the right thing, means not terminating a life, and that non, non-malfeasance is, you know, not terminating a life. Beneficence would be bringing a child into the world because it's the right thing to do, and, um, you know, children are innately good, and yes, we don't want to harm them. So, same scenario, different perspectives. Keep that in mind. And again, HIPAA is H-I-P-A-A. <clears throat> Some examples of ethical conflicts, because really we see um, sort of these some of these ethical terms and ethical scenarios at odds with one another. So do we warn people when we know that there's something that's running in their family versus does that family have the right to privacy? Does the original person have the right to privacy? There was a big case called ABC versus St. George's Healthcare uh, NHS Trust, where a woman, her father had Huntington's disease. He did not want to disclose this to his pregnant daughter. The father ended up murdering her mother, um, and the woman basically tried to, you know, say that she should have had this information disclosed to her. Um, that the physicians had a duty to warn that Huntington's ran in her family because now her daughter um, or her, her child is at risk for it. Um, another one at odds, this was a Texas bill, was a wrongful birth versus paternalism and the physician's right to withhold. This was regarding um, people who have children who are severely disabled, who the physician might have known that that was a likely possibility, but the physician didn't warn them. Uh, due to paternalism and thinking that, you know, abortion was wrong. And so some of these parents would think that there was a wrongful birth. And this bill didn't end up getting very far, uh, but it was recent and I thought it was worth including here. And then autonomy versus paternalism. You know, do we have a right to ge genetic ignorance? What if it affects our family? Does it matter if our family is childbearing or non-childbearing? Should it matter if we have a treatment available? Should it matter if you know, that treatment is free or inexpensive, what are sort of the limits? You'll find that in this lecture, I mostly ask questions, I don't give answers. In terms of social issues, stigma is a big one. I'm just using albinism as an example. Um, so in Kenya, where people tend to have dark skin, stigma is very high for people with albinism, also the risks of sudden exposure related problems is very high, especially in areas that are poor in resources. Um, about one in 10,000 people in Africa have albinism. Um, 
Interestingly, there is less stigma in the Hopi Indians of Arizona, where the prevalence is about 1 in 200. Um, and the reason why the prevalence is so high there is has something to do with cultural considerations um, and some religious considerations, but also other non-random mating scenarios. So in Arizona, it's also quite warm and sunny and um, you know not ideal to be out in the sun all day if you're albino. So perhaps... You know, it's been posited, speculated that the albino males were staying home with the women in the houses doing more of the domestic work and maybe they had more time to um, uh, make some babies and thus we see higher rates there potentially. Um, it is still stigmatized in that group but because they're seeing it in 1 in 200 people as opposed to 1 in 10,000, not nearly as rare and there is a little bit more acceptance um, and as well as like internal in-group social support. Um, We also see albinism in other countries um, and, you know, the ways in which it is perceived and the support that they enjoy um, depends. Here's, I just try to always give you guys um, diverse examples because not all people in the world are white, not, uh, even albino people. So here's just sort of a random collection of different people from different countries who all have albinism. Another societal issue um, that has a lot of, I mean, stigma is the big societal issue we're talking about, but another condition that we see a lot of societal issue is anything that's really disfiguring. Um, so albinism, you can see, I mean, some of these people, they have certainly have unique phenotypes, but um, there's no real change to like the bone structure. Whereas for some conditions that are genetic, including ectodermal dysplasia, we do see some pretty marked phenotype differences. So in this case, the bones, pores, nails, cartilage, teeth, etc., are all affected. A lot of these people end up losing their teeth. Some do and some do not end up wearing dentures, depending on what their preference is. Um, and basically, this is a very early problem. It happens when... So we've got genetic mutations that affect the development of the ectoderm and the mesoderm and how those two layers interact. And so we have like widespread problems that affect multiple organ systems, multiple body parts, because it was a very early developmental um, process that was interrupted by that genetic mutation. This person, Melanie Gatos, has gone on to become an international model. I highly recommend this little video clip for you to watch. Other social issues, so public perception of what it means to have a disease and whether or not you even have a disease. Sometimes symptoms can be misinterpreted or otherwise ambiguous um, and can be um, interpreted as, you know, something that's more stigmatized even. So in the case of Tourette syndrome, which is characterized by tics, um, it can be perceived as perhaps drug addiction, you know, just bad behavior being um, just inappropriate and lewd. The tics can be quite painful. And so people will end up swearing and cursing sometimes. Um, and then another potential issue is family perception and concern over risk to future generations. <laughs> it does seem that Tourette syndrome follows a autosomal dominant mode of inheritance. So having just one copy will give you the um, condition. And <coughs> so here's a video clip from TLC's 90 Day Fiance about basically this guy is telling his mother that his fiance, um, so this guy Andre, is telling his mother um, that, yeah, his fiance has Tourette syndrome and that there's a 50% chance that their children will get it. And just seeing her response and then the response of the girl. So you can watch these videos on your own as well. Pretty, pretty heart-wrenching stuff. Um, so some topics related to genetics that have a lot of financial, ethical, legal, and social issues embedded in them include, but are not limited to, genetic testing of fetuses in minor children, especially surrounding adult onset disorders and disorders for which there is no prevention or cure like Huntington's. Obviously, abortion of fetuses with genetic disorders. In some countries, like Iceland, most babies that are found to have Down syndrome are terminated. Um, and so there's been some discussion in the international media about if this is a good thing because it's you know promoting just the healthiest possible people in a country, or is it a bad thing because it's essentially a genocide and we're eradicating a group of people 
because they've got a chromosomal difference, you know, one extra chromosome. Um, so that will continue to be debated. Gene editing in both fetuses and adults, so actually going in and changing the DNA within cells so that cells function a way that we would like them to. Um, gene therapy and who pays for it. In vitro fertilization for making babies, especially for LGBTQ couples. Um, withholding treatment for genetic disorders. Um, you know, on the part of parents or for like an elderly caregiver or somebody else who you have durable power of attorney over for religious reasons, for all sorts of reasons, and many, many, many more. I'm sure you can come up with some great ones. I'm happy to discuss ethical issues with you guys anytime, although I promise you I will try to be Switzerland and just remain super neutral. I will ask questions. I have no answers. I have no answers. Some laws related to genetic information is, uh, well, HIPAA first, spelled correctly this time, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So this protects our protected health information, which is any identifiable information that meets certain criteria. And y'all have had that spoon fed to you so many times, we won't even go there. Um, in terms of genetic information, it needs to be individually identifiable and maintained by a healthcare provider, health plan, healthcare clearinghouse, et cetera. It does not protect non-identifiable information, such as aggregate study data as part of research, diagnostic tests that are not entered into the medical record, although I can't really imagine a time when you would be doing diagnostic tests and not entering them into the medical record, but there you have it. Maybe some sort of, I don't know, genetic testing at a bar or free clinic or pop-up or something, I don't know. Um, so any genetic tests that are done without PHI, um, would be unprotected as well. So that's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, H-I-P-A-A. -A. Then HIPAA is not enough. So there was a lot of discussion over what we call genetic exceptionalism. Is, is genetic information special, so special that we need additional protections? And the general consensus was yes. So now we have GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act which took a long time to become a law. It was introduced in 1995. Um, they developed a working group called the Coalition for Genetic Fairness to discuss this genetic exceptionalism and if we needed special types of handling for this type of medical data, you know, positing that HIPAA just was not sufficient. Finally was signed into a law in 2008 uh, through Congress, or got through Congress, and then in 2009 became a law. Um, and then hot off the press in 2019, we had a removal of incentive programs from the EEOC, the Equal Opportunity, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Previously, they had said that employer wellness programs um, could reduce insurance premiums for participants um, who had genetic testing, but these provisions were removed because it basically was not consistent with the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act as well as the Americans for Disabilities Act. So those um, those incentive programs have been removed. So HIPAA is broken down into two titles. The first title of HIPAA protects against discrimination from health insurers and makes it so that insurees cannot be discriminated against based off of their genetic information. You can't be denied access to a group health plan or something like that based off of your genetic information. Um, this covers health insurance. It does not cover other types of insurance, car insurance, disability insurance, long-term care insurance, all those other types of insurances, mortgage insurance. When you're old, you'll have insurance for your insurance, but doesn't cover those, just good old-fashioned health insurance. And then Title II protects against um, discrimination on the part of employee, employment. So you can't be discriminated against as a current employee, past employee, applicant to become an employee. Um, and this protects against unlock, unlawful acquisition of your genetic information, use of your genetic information, or disclosure of your genetic information. And then, so people often ask, OK, so why do we need the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA, if we have the American for Disabilities Act, ADA? Well, ADA only protects people who have a pre-existing disabling condition, whereas GINA adds additional protections for those for whom disease is a possibility. 
though they are not presently disabled, but they're at increased risk due to their genetics. So we do need Gina on top of the ADA. Gina does not cover, as I mentioned before, um, you know, things that are not entered into the, or sorry, that was HIPAA. HIPAA does not cover things that are not entered into the medical record. GINA does not cover things that are lawfully acquired, um, such as through inadvertent acquisition, you know, accidental, through legal loopholes, which we will talk about um, a little bit. So let's say somebody is trying to figure out if you've committed a crime or something, um, all this would not be at work, but you know, there are certain ways that people can get your DNA if you just like leave it behind, you leave a cigarette in an ashtray or something like that. Um, acquisition via DNA testing, etc. cetera. Um, obviously, if, with your consent, that's lawful too. Lawful disclosure um, to the employee, the applicant, the family member, et cetera, researcher, you know, there would be terms and conditions there that would be clear. Um, and then it does not cover other types of insurance, like I said before, no car insurance, health insurance, or sorry, it covers health insurance, no car insurance, disability insurance, mortgage insurance, any of that, motorcycle insurance, homeowner's insurance, um, and many companies can, will, and do discriminate against people based on their genetics. Um, they often fault those who voluntarily disclose genetic information and say that that's why their premiums have risen. So keep that in mind. There's a link here to an article that you can read. So Gina doesn't cover non-health insurance or lawful use or disclosure, um, though there are certainly some pretty stringent definitions there. Some notable cases that um, happened, and I'm going to let you look these up on your own, um, but they're all pretty interesting and they had different results, but one that I think is especially interesting is this Lowe versus Atlas Logistics Group at the top, and this was a case where employees were defecating at work in a warehouse, and the employer obviously was not thrilled about having feces all over his warehouse or her warehouse, so decided to take the feces and genetically test them, and it was determined that this was unlawful acquisition of um, a person's genetic information, um, and so the company had to pay a pretty huge fine to the devious defecators for violating their uh, right to privacy under GINA. So you can look up these other ones. Um, I think it's always interesting to know sort of what are the limits of these laws and be sure to stay tuned because there will be more things that come up in recent years. I am positive of that. So that is it for the primer. Again, there are tons of ethical glossaries for you. Keep in mind that these ethical principles tend to be sort of competing against other things and depending on who the stakeholder is, they might have a very different view of what justice means or what uh, beneficence means. Um, we've got the Americans with Disabilities Act that protects people with active and ongoing disabilities. HIPAA protects against um, disclosure, you know, protects your privacy of your genetic information so long as it's part of the medical record and meets other criteria for being identifiable. Um, but those aren't enough because we have genetic exceptionalism and genetic information needs to be more protected. Also, we now know that um, the Americans with Disabilities Act only protects people with active disability and some people with genetic mutations are at increased risk for future disabilities, so they need protections too. That's it for now. I hope you learned a lot. Take care, everybody.